Um, so let's start with, I'll do a quick sort of uh, intro and launch into a couple questions. Uh, you're with Redpoint Ventures, uh, a venture firm based, I think they're based in the Bay Area or on the East Coast? You That's right, a... based in the Bay Area, but I live in New York. But you do live in New York. That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, and in the last 20 years, Redpoint has raised nine funds, a total of $7.2 billion, uh, made 578 investments, and has already had 181 exits. So that's sort of a, an overview of Redpoint uh, to get a sense of the, the scale of, of who we're talking about here. Um, and so Logan, before we discuss your career at Redpoint, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the career path that led you there. Uh, you started as an analyst with Deutsche Bank and you very quickly branched out into the onto this VC path. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? How that transition happened and why and what pulled you into that direction? Yeah, totally. Um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do out of undergrad. Um, I went to work at Deutsche Bank just because they recruited on campus. And uh, I people older than me had gotten into investment banking that I looked up to. And it felt like it was a um, it was going to maintain optionality of having to make a decision on on what I actually wanted to do uh, for my career. And so I did that. I quickly realized I didn't enjoy it, uh, for a bunch of different reasons. I'm happy to talk through, but it wasn't the right, um, fit personality wise and role wise for me. Uh, and I was fortunate enough, uh, at the time I was, uh, my roommate actually recruited me to go work at a, um, merchant bank kind of doing advisory and investing for technology, uh, software specific companies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did that for a couple of years and it was kind of my first, uh, foray into working with, uh, venture back companies, startups, all of that. And, uh, so it was just, just happenstance. It happened to be the person I shared a wall with, uh, as my roommate that kind of recruited me over to go do it. And, uh, yeah, the rest is, uh, I guess has been a pretty linear path of, of investing and working with tech companies since then. And um, so you're now the managing director at Redpoint Ventures, um, and you've been in this role for the last four years. C can you tell us a bit about your role at Redpoint uh, and just give us an overview of that before we kind of dig in? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, we have, um, I think we probably have six or $7 billion under management. We have two separate funds. We have an early stage fund that does seed Series A investing, and then I'm one of the three managing directors on our growth fund. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's typically series B, series C, companies that have already raised institutional capital. We're typically investing um, $20 million uh, up to 50, 60, 70 million um, in companies that um, are emerging in their category. Uh, and ideally, uh, on the path of being big, independent, standalone public companies, uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with companies that People probably know like Stripe and um, DraftKings, uh, Twilio, um, among a bunch of others. And yeah. so, yeah, we're typically partnering at the Series B. My day-to-day -day is I sit on a handful of boards. I uh, uh, am constantly um, evaluating new investment opportunities. Mm -hmm. I uh, manage our, uh, our, our junior group, uh, which is about five folks. We have a uh, platform team that helps our portfolio companies, everything from customer introductions to uh, to marketing to uh, help on recruiting. And so that team rolls into me. And then uh, the other part of our job is raising money from uh, limited partners. And so that can include everything from uh, endowments to pension plans, to family offices, to fund to funds, to uh, on down the line hospital systems. And uh, so uh, about once every three to four years, I, uh, I spend a considerable amount of time with, uh, with limited partners raising money. And, uh, and that allows us to uh, do our day job, which is uh, backing entrepreneurs that are pursuing, um, you know, the, trying to change the world in some way. So yeah. uh, it's a little bit of uh a bunch of different roles that sort of encompass one job. This, uh, it's kind of, it kind of mirrors the, the startup entrepreneur experience, right? Just being on the road, fundraising, raising enough to to have a two year two year. Well, you said four, but you know, uh, a pathway enough to, enough uh, funding to be able to then focus on developing the business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't want to over extrapolate the analogy. I uh, we we. Um, 
we're oftentimes able to, we take a portfolio approach to a lot of the things we do. There's definitely the, the uh, hat switching that you do and context switching on a daily basis of what is today going to look like. And so mm -hmm. that element of it definitely um, looks similar to a startup. Uh, I would say we, the highs are not nearly as high as uh, being an entrepreneur and the lows aren't nearly as low, um, just given <laughs> we have a portfolio of companies that we're working with. And so the successes feel good, but not nearly as euphoric, I think, as being a founder and those successes can feel, but the lows also aren't uh, nearly as low as the entrepreneurial journey. So mm -hmm. I don't try to uh, compare too much to, uh, to, to the entrepreneurs that we, we're fortunate enough to work with. Yeah. Well, so um, I, I do want to talk about specific examples of, uh, uh, that are in your portfolio. But before we do that, um, can you elaborate a little bit on the, the investment thesis for Redpoint? Um, what, what is the investment thesis? Uh, I noticed that you guys were invested in quite a variety of industries. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of the companies that you've invested in, but also I know that Netflix was on there, yep. Sonos. So there's there's hardware, there's you know consumer goods, uh, there's streaming services. How yeah, what is the thesis to 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 start there? Yeah, so the fund was founded uh, in '99 as an internet focused fund, uh, which used to be a thing. Now I think uh, everything is internet focused uh, in some way, yeah. shape, or form. Um, and so that was the original genesis of it. Uh, today. We spend about um, two thirds of our time in B2B in some way, shape or form. Uh, a lot of companies that, um, you know, unless you're in a specific vertical or um, looking for specific services, you might never have heard of, but um, software and B2B has been a, uh, a very um, value accretive sector to be investing in. So that's about two thirds of our time. A third is spent on other, uh, I would say. And so that's some combination of healthcare, uh, fintech, consumer internet. Um, obviously, I don't think we 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 woke up thinking we were going to invest in what became a uh, uh, DraftKings, uh, but it, we we happened to find a great entrepreneur that felt like um, a great opportunity to uh, to invest in. Similarly, with Netflix, I don't think we thought we would be investing in uh, DVDs over the mail, um, but there was a special entrepreneur going after an opportunity that made sense to us. And so we do want to spare some of our cycles for uh, just what we uh, categorize as other, um, kind of outside mm -hmm. of the, the bread and butter we wake up every day thinking about. And when we find a great entrepreneur, um, we, we want to partner with uh, we'll, uh, we'll make exceptions that are outside of, uh, down the middle of the fairway of the stuff we wake up every day thinking about. Oh, that, that, that's, that's super interesting. So I was wondering about that. Um, you know, there's these outliers and, and what were the motivations? So you talk about the, the founders, uh, were compelling. And can you tell us more about that? What, what, um, what were the characteristics? What were the the factors that influenced those decisions with those specific founders? Yeah, well, uh, Netflix predates me for sure, uh, but yeah. my partner Tim still sits on the board uh, there. And uh, I mean, I, I think people know um, Reed Hasting and now Ted have have done a fantastic job executing across a bunch of different cycles of that uh, business, from from uh, sending DVDs to licensing streaming content to now owned and original uh, content themselves. Uh, now they're getting into some stuff related to sports and gaming. And so um, that that business has iterated quite a bit over the years. I think if I were to extrapolate the lesson of Netflix uh, or DraftKings, for example, what Jason's been able to do there. Uh, part of my ignorance, can, can we just talk about, uh, I don't know what DraftKings is. Oh, okay. Yeah. So DraftKings is <laughs> a- no, everyone knows. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, they they spend a lot on pay, uh, marketing, so uh, you 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 maybe aren't in their target demo. But uh, DraftKings <laughs> DraftKings originally started as a daily fantasy, uh, uh, I guess betting site. I don't know what the terminology uh, would have been at the time. Right. Now it's a uh, it's a major. It's one of the two major mobile um, sports betting uh, operators okay. in, in the in the United States today. It's probably live in. Uh, 30 states maybe of the 50 and on their way to, to 50 as uh, as uh, sports betting has become more legalized. Um, that company originally though, they were, they kind of skirted around um, state licensing on gambling because it was a daily 
fantasy um, site originally, and uh, and so not technically a uh, a sports betting um, site was like the way they were able to get going. Uh, the once upon a time they tried to merge with their biggest uh, rival and competitor, and that ultimately got blocked. Uh, an antitrust a company called FanDuel as well. Mm. Um, they've since evolved from this daily sports. Uh, 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 world into a full blown, um, I'll get my terminal terminology wrong on it, but, uh, a sports betting site that needs to be licensed in all the States that they operate in. And, uh, that business has gone through a bunch of near death experiences and iterations along the way. And to your, I guess, to extrapolate on both of those anecdotes, uh, I would say that the commonalities and entrepreneurs that proved to be successful are just the rate of learning and the ability to uh, be the be the sponge that soaks up information uh, on a daily basis. Uh, the analogy I'll use is the best entrepreneurs I work with um, will recognize that there's uh, a fire and that looks hot and a stove and that looks hot and a candle and that looks hot. And they'll recognize that there's potential issues in each of those if they put their hand into it. Uh, and and so seeing that those potential situations could cause problems for the company and being aware enough that those look similar and that they'll burn your hand, uh, but they're all kind of unique in their own ways. The best entrepreneurs are able to uh, see those situations, ask for help when they present themselves, and able to iterate the business from where it started to where it's going. Ultimately, mm -hmm. no idea is ever perfect right out of the box with what you're starting with. I think anyone, I mean, we use DraftKings and Netflix as an example, but if you look at uh, Facebook or Apple or uh, or uh, Twitter or whatever it is, companies evolve uh, over the years. And the ones that stay static, the blockbusters of the world, or the um, or, or the ones that ultimately don't make it, uh, are the ones that aren't able to change their business as the market evolves. And the ones that end up building enduring, lasting companies usually need multiple different acts and changes along the way. Um, Microsoft had to survive being a PC only business. Uh, they missed the wave on mobile in a meaningful way. And now they're a juggernaut uh, because of cloud computing and AI, mm -hmm. right? And Apple had a near death, death experience uh, before Steve Jobs came back in. And uh, now it's whatever, a $3 trillion company because of their ability to iterate on what was once just a uh, PC uh, laptop or his PC uh, computer that uh, that that Steve and uh, Wozniacki started in the late seventies, and so the ultimate best CEOs are able to continue to iterate and evolve the business as uh, new opportunities present themselves. Yeah, that's great. That's a, a really fantastic um, observation and analysis. Uh, yeah, the c capacity to pivot, to adapt, to deal with, uh, to troubleshoot in in a way that makes sense for the the problem that presents itself. Um, so um, let's see, let's break it down a, a bit more. Uh, how many pitch decks do you review every year or per week or per day? I don't know, what, what, whatever number pops Yeah, up. it's a good question. Um, I don't do as much because at the stage that I'm investing, it's uh, there's usually some threshold of, of revenue or um, uh, substance that um, a company has gotten to in, in, in a way that right. so when you're looking at a, at a potential series B, so what is that um, uh, annual recurring revenue that you're looking for? Yeah, know. usually low single digits, millions growing three, four X, five X, something like that is typically uh, the the profile. Uh, it's usually mm -hmm. consuming capital uh, for their need to raise more money um, is is the typical profile of the company. I probably meet I probably meet a company a day would be my my guess. Uh, my colleagues on the early stage uh, team meet probably four a day. Um, and so you can extrapolate, I don't know how many business days there are in a year, uh, something 300 or, or, or something like that, 280. Uh, so I probably end up meeting 280 companies or something a year in some way, shape or form uh, versus my uh, early stage colleagues probably meet something closer to a thousand. Wow. Uh, so yeah, so so that's kind of the rough of it. Um, most of the time they have pitch decks ready to go. Sometimes it's pre-meetings uh, and you know it's ahead of them actually fundraising. 
but we're we're getting to know each other. I've actually gotten better. I want to figure out exactly how much time I'm spending where. So I've gotten a lot better in color coding my calendar. I'm trying to figure out how much time I spend hiring people, how much time I spend working with portfolio companies, how much time I spend uh, meeting with our investors, uh, mm -hmm. all the different components of the job. So I could probably give you a you know, more accurate answer in a couple months time, once I've been you able know, I mean, to- That's a big picture. Okay, so you know, uh, your your junior associates are looking at about a thousand decks. So you know, our companies, if they're sending a deck, they're going through them first. Um, what are the what are the key elements that you want to see out the door? Uh, what 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 are you looking for when you first look at the pitch deck? And then you know, before doing too much work and getting into due diligence and whatnot. Yeah, I guess, I guess one one uh, uh, I guess distinction on that is our not when I say early stage, I mean the people uh, on we have two separate funds, and so our fund that is doing seed Series A, they're usually looking at more opportunities. Oh, right. We're often not doing like a pre qualification generally. Um, we can know for the most part from the outside in if a company meets the the thresholds that we're thinking about. And so what are what are some of the thresholds for us that we'll look at? Um, uh, well, I would say 95% of the companies we invest in, maybe more have raised outside capital already. And so we have an upstream group of investors that we stay close to and we monitor their portfolios and keep in touch with them. Um, usually there's already a seed or series a investor involved. And so, um, that is typically a signal in some way, shape or form. Um, there's probably a group of, I don't know, 40 of them that we track, I would say, and try to stay on top of their portfolio, keep in touch with them with when, when stuff's going to be raising. And so one of the brief qualifications is just simply have other people already invested in it. Um, and that's usually a indication, uh, for us, not always, there's been a bunch of fantastic bootstrapped companies over the years. And so we need to make sure we're maintaining an aperture that's broader than just that, but it's a, it's a decent heuristic to think about is usually there's some funding already in one of these companies. Uh, what are we looking for when we're actually investing or what are the types of things, uh, that we think about? So one, uh, we talked about the iterative learning of founders. Uh, that's obviously an important one for us. Uh, it's hard to vet. Uh, in a first meeting, usually you get to know that over time, but we are looking to learn that the rate or see that the rate of growth and learning of the entrepreneur um, uh, is is at a significant slope. And um, usually you can almost find that from the first meeting you have with them to the end. They uh, they have been meeting with other investors in the the refinement of how they articulate their vision has gotten better. The their ability to answer specific questions has gotten better. Um, their uh, thought process on potential exter external considerations related to competitors or whatever. Usually, you're able to see that rate of learning in some way, shape, or form from the first meeting through the final meeting has mm -hmm. evolved in a meaningful way. But uh, trying to tease that out is obviously an important one. The other things we look for, uh, we want to find that product market fit has been established in some way, shape, or form. What is product market fit? It's a little bit of an ethereal term, but uh, the way mm -hmm. I think about it is, will the dogs eat the dog food? Are we able to validate that um, that the product that's in market resonates with the customers, that there's some pain point that existed uh, for an end user, and that this product uniquely solves it in some way, shape, or form? So usually mm -hmm. that involves talking to industry experts, potential customers, actual customers, um, uh, whoever we can do diligence around to figure out, does that product solve the need in the market? So that's an important thing for us. The other ones that we think about are, uh, so um, we we like to see that there's some level of compounding differentiation that can occur. Sometimes that's mm -hmm. IP. So there's some technical advantage that the company has. Uh, so IP is a big one. Sometimes it's network effects. Uh, so Facebook's a canonical example of each incremental person that joined the network made it more valuable for everyone else. So that can be a component of it. Sometimes it's distribution advantages. So you can mm -hmm. sign an exclusivity agreement with XYZ group, and uh, that can be advantageous. Sometimes it's legal. We talked about DraftKings. DraftKings had to go through a bunch of different licensing in a bunch of different states. And so there's there's advantages that come with scale. And so when we're going to give them capital, we hope those will continue to accrue uh, to the winner in the category. Um, and then the final one, I guess I would highlight is that... Uh, we actually, we want to invest in big markets. They don't necessarily need to be big markets today. Some of the best companies, I mean, to use DraftKings or Netflix or Facebook as examples, um, those markets were pretty small initially, but they were growing at a really fast rate. And so oftentimes the biggest companies that get started 
are in small markets that are growing really quickly and are able to capture uh, reciprocal value from adjacencies in some way, shape, or form. And so we just we want to see that we can believe in the course of time that the market opportunity is going to be big enough to warrant an independent standalone public business if they execute on the vision of things that they maybe have visibility into. Mm -hmm. So uh, sort of on that note of, um, you know, traction, growth, and, you know, evolution of the company, we do have a question in the chat that uh, touches on that. And they want to say, what, what are uh, the, the sort of the red flags, the pain points that you see in the two different models in the B2B versus B2C model as they're growing from C to Series A, maybe in Series B, what are the struggles and the uh, in the differences between the two um, uh, models, business models, uh, B2B versus B2C? Yeah, B2B is uh, much simpler in some ways, right? I think uh, 90% of B2B companies these days are subscription in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and you can usually um, get pretty candid feedback from your existing customers uh, or prospective customers. There's some finite universe of people that you can talk to and figure out, all right, well, does the product validate uh, the pain point that they have? And so can we um, can we extrapolate forward? All right, if it if it fits the pain point for Tommy uh, at XYZ company, will it also solve the pain point for Jenny at QRS company? And so usually um, the the validation approach that comes from evaluating those companies uh, along the way tends to be consistent. And oftentimes your customers can tell you what to build next. You don't want to overly mm -hmm. index to what what any individual customer is telling you, but it's not the, um, the Steve Jobs adage of uh, telling the world what they need, uh, oftentimes in B2B. In the elements of early stage, sometimes it can be that where you're getting it off the ground and it's hard to articulate how it could solve this pain point. But usually you can find people that share your vision and say, yes, if you do this for me, then uh, that will solve my pain point. In consumer, it's a lot harder to find that just because the N of prospective customers, the number of prospective customers is so much higher and you suffer from uh, sample bias. And so let's say you're selling into construction or healthcare or whatever, it, it, name XYZ industry. Mm -hmm. You can talk to the universe of, of industry experts or people that know the particular space and come up with some understanding of will the dogs eat the dog food? Will the uh, will the thing sort itself out uh, from a from a pain point standpoint? And what direction should you take it? In consumer, that's a lot harder to do uh, because there's so many more consumers out there, and oftentimes you're you can be fooled by the randomness of the sample bias of who you talk mm -hmm. to in some way, shape, or form. And it's it's the devils in the details of if 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 people know this example, Webman was a internet oh, yeah. company that went bankrupt uh, doing delivery to customers, and that was actually a great um, uh, business uh, or a great service to individual users. And so, if you sampled all their individual users, people loved it. It was great. They delivered your I groceries. Have web van crates in my shed. I just yeah, yeah, great. I mean, honestly, people yeah. love people love the product, right? It was, it was so a good. it was a great service. The problem was, was it a great business? No, it wasn't a great business. And it wasn't until DoorDash or Instacart or yeah. mobile became prolific, and you were able to execute on different strategies around delivery and real time and alerts and all that stuff, that this was a more sustainable business. And so it wasn't that the 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 theme was wrong. The theme was right. It was an inevitability we were going to get groceries delivered at home, right? That was, that was an inevitable thing that we were going to do. It required mobile and it required uh, the right unit economics to make that business model work. And so I think consumer you can conflate a bunch of different things and you need to ultimately be able to prove out that not just does the service work, people like free things. And so if your mm -hmm. unit economics are totally upside down, you could sample all your customers and they would say, this is amazing. I love free dollars, right? Uh, and I think we saw that with Uber in their early days. Everyone loved like getting from A to B for $2 when it costs you more than that, just to you know turn on your car or something. Uh, but was that a sustainable business? And those are the harder questions you have to ask yourself, especially when you're betting on 
getting to scale before you know okay well if we can get that the this size company then we can get a better credit facility our cost of capital will go down we can bundle different things together mm -hmm. and i think that's much harder in consumer than it is in b2b yeah that is such a yeah, that's a fantastic observation on the B2C model, because even though you have traction, your consumers love it, they're paying for the service, uh, it doesn't necessarily validate the business model, like the, the, all the elements have to be there. Um, so with Webvan, it was just, yeah, bad timing, right? Yeah, bad timing. I mean, <laughs> right idea. Uh, it, it was the wrong execution on that idea. And I think that's true. I mean, we could come up with, um, there are a bunch of uh, pre-smartphone uh, uh, taxi call delivery service companies, right? And like no one yeah. wanted to use it until Uber went after the black car market. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it requires the right time. I don't mm -hmm. think any idea is unique. Oftentimes entrepreneurs have this preciousness around we don't see it too often uh, at our stage, but early stage investors will where they want you to sign an NDA. And as a mm -hmm. rule, we generally don't do it, not because uh, not because we want to take those ideas and do anything with them. It's just I don't think any idea is proprietary at the end of the mm -hmm. day. What's proprietary is is the moment in time at which you're doing it. So answering the why now of this, you need to be able to answer why now and why you and what happens if it goes right, like what what can work. Uh, because no idea, like everything's been tried in some way, shape or form. Um, and so there needs to be some unique catalyst behind your your ability to execute on it and what's changed in the market to allow you to run through mm -hmm. it. Uh, because no one, uh, there, there's, I don't know, 7 billion people in the world and a lot of them are thinking of ideas. And so it, it's, it, it's going to require you to actually go out and execute on it and not just okay. the individual idea for it to become a successful company. Yeah. No, thank you for that. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, I wanted to kind of, uh, something you said earlier uh, that grabbed my attention. So Redpoint has, um, you do provide some pretty serious support to your portfolio companies. Uh, and your website's awesome, by the way. Uh, Thank lots you. of great content on there. The uh, have a website in venture, by the way, is to be redoing it. So I think we're we're updating it currently. Uh, okay. But yes, we'll, we'll hopefully but from keep a, really From good a content elements. perspective, which is even, you know, uh, I guess a bigger compliment, just the pure content is was just really great. Um, what uh so yeah can you tell us about what's what's the methodology so you invest you invest in your portfolio companies and then what uh it sounds like uh, there's a lot of resources and a lot of support so what, what's the methodology there for um, yeah um no it's a great question uh i would say my job as an investor uh is to earn the right. I think ultimately entrepreneurs need to run their companies and uh, I'm a career investor and I don't even know if I would know what to do if dropped in to run any individual company that I work with. Uh, and so I definitely view the job of the entrepreneur uh, to execute on their vision for, for what they're going after. Uh, that said, there's usually one, two, three decisions a year that prove to be critically important for an individual company. And we need to uh, earn the right to help influence or shape the uh, decisioning and have the credibility with the entrepreneur that when those decisions come up, we're there to potentially support. And so that's an earned relationship that is built with trust over uh, days, weeks, months, board meetings, uh, you know, budget cycles, all of those things. And so I really view the core competency of what we do is those those individual moments in time that that occur episodically to really help an entrepreneur make a decision based on prior experience or people we know or um, whatever it is. And so that's the core competency of the job. Uh, but that said, uh, there's there's uh, sprinkles on top that we can be influential with as well. And um, oftentimes those words I just said can sound like a word salad or a GPT hallucination of how do you actually differentiate versus other venture investors that say, we also are in the right to help you make critical decisions. And so with that comes a need for uh, additional uh, support 
and uh, and things that we can do uniquely well against other people that we're competing against. And uh, and so those will include support with marketing, uh, support with customer introductions, and support with recruiting and talent. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, any one of those could fall into the bucket of the one to three things in a given year that really makes a difference. It's usually not customer intros, although that's the most tangible thing that people really uh, gravitate to. Um, I found that uh, the most successful companies uh, aren't reliant on um, investors to, to source customers for them. Uh, it's usually it, when that happens, it's it's great, but uh, usually that's just a a cherry on top. Talent can be often one of those one, two, three things a year, given a particular hire. And so having people that are dedicated and thinking about that every day is is important. And so we have two and a half people that wake up every day thinking about that across our portfolio, um, trying to access mostly VP level uh, or C-level people, uh, be it marketing or product or sales or uh, engineering or whatever it is. And so I think that can be influential as well. Uh, the final one is a lot of our companies struggle with uh, with marketing uh, mm -hmm. and figuring out how to get the word out about themselves. We're often backing technical founders who uh, um, maybe aren't the best self promoters uh, and helping them figure out uh, product marketing and how to articulate parts of what they do. Uh, either for prospective employees or customers or future hires, uh, or I guess that's prospective employees, but future hires or, or, or future investors, helping mm -hmm. them in that way shape their narrative uh, ends up being a key component of what we do as well. And so those services kind of all come together to um, bring a totality of things that uh, hopefully accelerate uh, the chances of success for a given portfolio company. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's uh, it, case by case uh, on when it helps most, but that's at least what yeah. we're trying to do. Yeah, no, yeah, we, we definitely uh, see trends in uh, um, lots of requests for support in the area of marketing, for sure, uh, especially with engineering heavy teams. Um, yeah, that's an area we try to support in quite heavily too. Um, so there's an interesting question here. And then, you know, again, please, anyone uh, in the room, feel free to jump in, ask questions. Um, so this question, I was going to say, I've seen it the other way around, but maybe you can think of examples, um, companies that, uh, will leverage their B2B, uh, revenue, success, traction, whatever to fund, um, scaling into, a, a the, and launching their B2C model. So I've, I've seen it often the other way around where it's yeah. easy to test with B2C and then start getting a little bit of traction to get some comfort to, to basically pilot test. Uh, and then when it's ready at that level, launch at a, you know, at a B2B level. But um, yeah, I'm trying to think of. Yeah, I'm curious um, where I'm that's coming from. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a specific example of that. You're right. Normally, I think of it's the other way the around. Other way around. Um, for example, like, you know, Wayfair started as a direct to consumer business and then built out a B2B, uh, component after, um, right. And so also a lot of, uh, consumer goods like CPG, you'll f try selling, you know, uh, online through Instagram, through your website, through Amazon. And then once you get that traction, you start, uh, you can hit the larger retailers or, uh, then go talk to, you know, the target. Yeah. I, I may be speaking out of school. I mean, Adobe was early days sort of consumer uh, on desktops, and then it moved B2B uh, mm -hmm. in for a large part of their revenue, but still have consumer as a big in market as well. So I don't know. I'm curious, uh, specific examples. It's not That's something I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure there are. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's put that on the back burner. There's a question here in the room from Penny. Ready? Thank you so much for being here, Logan. I'm very grateful to have all your insights. It's very inspiring. My name is Penny Lane, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Nextera Tech, where we are using radar and machine learning to transform the way that we can differentiate material in a non-invasive manner. So I have a question about how does age um, of the founders impact your investment, and what 
is the maybe youngest age of founders you've seen and what did they have that really made you confident that they could succeed without as much experience? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think different markets have different, uh, different considerations around age. And I think there's a question of how much does experience matter uh, in a given area versus how much does um, just 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 the grit and determination that you often have when you're in your early uh, 20s and um, your income levels are negligible and your willingness to pull all nighters is are, are higher and all of that. Uh, and so I think every market tends to be a little different. I I, I typically find that consumer for the most part, um, we'll have younger founders and B2B will have older founders. Um, I didn't wake up, I don't know about uh, others, but uh, I don't think I did, did come up with a B2B company idea. You oftentimes need to be in an industry and observe some inefficiency or something going on in, in a unique way and then go out to to seek to solve it. And so there's some uh, requisite of experience to have that insight oftentimes. And so uh, B2B founders, I think, tend to be a little older because of that. They've they've often had an existing job. Um, consumer, uh, we can all have consumer ideas. We all have had consumer ideas of, hey, why does this exist? Or why does this world exist like that? Um, and so I tend to find that the consumer founders are, are often a touch younger. It's not a perfect analogy, but I think if you go back and look at a lot of the the the, the Evan Spiegels of the world, or the Mark Zuckerbergs, or Steve Jobs way back when, or uh, Bill Gates, um, you know, a lot of people that found success in some of the more consumer oriented arenas. Uh, although I guess Gates was kind of B two B as well. Um, often tend to be a little bit younger. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of the other part of the question, the youngest things that you see, there is a level, I mean, I feel it today, uh, as you get older, um, the sacrifices you're able to make because of circumstances just tend to go down. And uh, it could be life considerations. You could have kids, uh, you could have a family to support. Um, it could be physical considerations of, Hey, you need six hours of sleep. And when you were 22 years old, you didn't need six, you didn't need, uh, six hours of sleep. You could operate with less than that. Um, and so the, the most successful younger entrepreneurs I find, uh, tend to have an all in mindset of, uh, this is all they wake up every day thinking about, um, in some ways, uh, they're, they're often not fully adjusted to what we would define as normal in some way, shape or form. They're, they're usually like maniacally focused on solving this problem to the, at the expense of so many other things. Uh, and I always think about like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or some of these people that you hear amazing stories about, about their grit and determination and ambition and work ethic. And then you think about it, you take a step back and you're like, I don't know if I would be friends with that person uh, because they're so singularly focused on something. And and I, I, I find that that is a characteristic of the young founders uh, that tend to be successful are just so singularly focused on this mission at odds of anything else. To be an entrepreneur is to... Uh, is to believe in yourself uh, beyond which is is purely logic based, right? Uh, if you're if you're just logical about something and you're you you have high ambitions, then the the likelihood of success is probably not worth the risk of the pursuit. But you have some unique insight and you, some unique belief in belief in yourself and some unique uh, competency that you're going to pursue. Uh, to be an entrepreneur. And so I, I have tons of admiration for anyone that does it. Uh, and it requires just a unique determination and uh, ambition and belief in yourself um, that I think you can develop if you've been in industry for a while and you're a little bit early, uh, older in your career. When you're um, when you're earlier in your career, it's almost um, the line between delusional and uh, and ambitious and world changing can often be very blurry, and uh, and you're only determined to be world changing uh, 
once people stop calling you delusional in some ways. And so if you go read early stories of Steve Jobs and how insufferable he was, or Mark Zuckerberg and how insufferable he was, like these were very arrogant, delusional people in the early days uh, that just so happened to change the world in part uh, because of that. And so I think that's probably the best example, but. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of laughter here. I don't know if you could hear it on the. <laughs> no, I couldn't. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, I, I'm glad. Glad this isn't dry for people. No, no, it's so good. Uh, so now we'll take that into account when we filter the companies for the incubator. Yes, program. Like, yes. Miswired, miswired, sociopathic, uh, right, right. delusional. I think those yeah. are the best characteristics. I need to hire psychologists on the team to help us filter. Yeah. That's right. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so oh, we do have another question, Sharon. Ready? Um, question. Thank you for your for your remarks, by the way. Um, just question around uh, generative AI, not necessarily um, companies where that's kind of the product they're building, but more how you see that um, impacting some of the spaces that you look at, some of the business models, um, like where you see companies effectively, you know, bringing that into their um, operations, or um, and where, like where it's kind of hot air, and where you see it making material differences. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you, this is something we think a lot about. So I'll give you a slightly longer answer. Uh, but um, yeah, if there's anything specific to, to drill in on. So there's the, there's the foundation model companies, which I, uh, people probably know the names of them, but OpenAI and Anthropic and um, Facebook has an open source model. We're fortunate enough to partner with a company, Mistral uh, Europe. Um, these companies are consuming large amounts of ZP GPUs, uh, raising uh, enormous amounts of capital and pursuing actually building the underlying foundation models. Um, and so that's that's one bucket. It's created, uh, uh, It's it's people have raised a lot of money to go after it. We'll see what in the fullness of time that ends up looking like. Uh, but I put that in one bucket. Then there's... Um, what I would uh, what I would colloquially call kind of um, weird shit, uh, and I don't know exactly uh, how to characterize these things, and I don't know what the precedent for them is. But um, there's a company called Character AI where you can talk to different chatbots, and uh, they will emulate the personality of Elon Musk or Pikachu or you know a Mario brother or something, and you and people actually talk to them all day, and it <laughs> blows my mind that that's how people spend their time, but uh, I guess that just means I'm getting old. And um, so that's that's a weird thing. Mid journey, people have probably played around with that image generation. That's just like a weird thing. I don't know exactly what the precedent for text to prompt uh, of an image is and where that's gonna go, but it's just weird and cool. There's a company Runway ML that does it for video. Uh, and we'll see where that ends up going over time. And uh, but I think those are kind of just the the weird novel buckets that I'm not exactly sure how it's going to play out. But it's cool and it's fun to see those businesses, uh, and it makes you look at the world slightly differently. Um, then there's kind of the boring shit, which I would put mm -hmm. as just picks and shovels, enabling infrastructure, security, um, you know, whatever, da data input stuff, um, uh, a bunch of different things, um, uh, collaborative uh, sharing of uh, models and things like that. And that those things are unique for AI, but um, they're not, uh, there were precedents that existed before then. There's a company called Hugging Face that's sharing models now, uh, but the previous example was GitHub, right? And there's a whole bunch of different examples we can talk through that are just like new approaches to old problems uh, because of the form factor that AI presents. Then the, the final bucket that I spend most of my time in uh, is what, things that might have been uh, either okay companies in the past could now be great companies because of shifting service to software uh, or um, shifting human capital to uh, to um, you know variable expense in some way shape or form and um, the mission of software always was to increase productivity. And I think that's happened. Like, I think if we have an SAP ERP system in place, like that's increasing productivity. If you have toast as a point of sale at a restaurant, that's increasing productivity, increasing payments out to waiter waiters and waitresses and bartenders and all that. I think we can say that's increasing productivity in some way. But 
um, it's it's not having as meaningful of a shift of what maybe historically required large amounts of headcount to do or outsource teams in India or whatever it was that seems on the precipice of being able to be done by software. And so I think that's the most interesting world today that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about of like, you know, a lot of people talk about legal uh, as an example, and there's been companies raising lots of money to go after um, not just the existing software market of legal, but maybe what paralegals or associates would do uh, with some errors uh, historically and now can be done or augmented with artificial intelligence. And so that's one example. We're seeing it across uh, we're seeing it across healthcare for sure. I was talking to, I mean, if anyone does government contracting or anything like that, like the procurement process of inputting information into a government document to apply for an RFP is just a mind numbing amount of work. And hey, is it possible that now we can automate the RFP entry process so that we can make it easier to apply and bid for government jobs? And so there's these things that maybe historically would have required huge amounts of, of, of effort at an individual level, um, and now can be done by generative AI or on the cusp of being done by generative AI, it might take what looks like a okay service business into a great software company. And there's a lot of considerations that go into that. Obviously, we're, uh, there's, there's elements implied of this, of displacement of labor. And, uh, and so, I mean, that's something we've dealt with as a society for a long, long time. Uh, but could be coming at an increased rate. And so there's definitely like societal considerations that we need to think through with, with some of those things. But I think we're on the cusp of a lot of that stuff happening. And so there's, there's, there's that question that we're asking ourselves of where those opportunities exist that can turn service-oriented businesses or jobs into more software automated businesses or jobs. And so that's something that we're thinking a lot about. Any other follow-on questions? Andrew. Logan, hey, thanks so much for being here. I'm Andrew DeMille. I'm co-founder of Quantum Energy, Inc. And we're focused on measuring the true impact of renewable energy so that large-scale developers can build and large buyers can buy. Uh, my question is around the economics changing and where you've seen examples of company pointing to a rapidly growing market that's not really being seen yet. We provide impact analytics. We measure beyond carbon emissions. We measure public health, ecosystem, and the economic impacts of large-scale energy projects. Nobody's really asking for it too much yet on a broad scale, but there's some of the biggest players are asking for our help to do this. How do I communicate that to investors to show that where this market's going and this will be essential soon? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I think it's oftentimes these things are driven by... Um, social pressures that lead to uh, some form of government regulation or government mandate to drive market opportunity. And so I'll draw a parallel for you that I'm making up on the spot. So forgive me if it's not a perfect one, but uh, in the electronic healthcare record space, as a part of uh, the uh, the stimulus package in 2008, I'm going to be a little wrong on my details, so I, I, I'm, uh, I'm doing this off the cuff, but like they mandated uh, as a part of that, that hospital systems needed to move to electronic health records. Uh, there was a small business in Madison, Wisconsin that was doing uh, uh, health records at the time, and they were in the right place, right time when that mandate came out that uh, they were there to seize on the opportunity. And so that business today, I don't know if people know Epic Systems, it's uh, it's uh, beguiled in a bunch of different circles, but they it's a, it's, I don't know, two and a half billion dollar revenue company doing a billion dollars in uh, profit, or I don't know, $800 million in profit, growing 15% a year. And it basically has a monopoly on the electronic healthcare record market, totally bootstrapped. Judy Faulkner is the sole founder uh, and CEO, maybe, Maybe she has a co-founder, but she owns whatever, a vast majority of the business that's probably worth uh, $60, $80 billion, $100 billion, totally private, something like that. And uh, right place, right time, government regulation drove the considerations around it, and they were able to seize on it. And so I would say that there's, there's some elements of social norms that end up driving 
um, the, the, the policy. And so at that point in time, it was like, okay, well, of course we need EHR, uh, or we need electronic health records in place. Um, I would say that carbon emissions, you're seeing a bunch of different companies or renewable energy starting to lead, uh, with their actions around, uh, the considerations on these things and being net neutral on carbon emissions and things like that. And now we're potentially moving to a place that uh, these things are going to be mandated and regulated by the government that you uh, that you have to do this. I've found that um, at the end of the day, there's only so many businesses that will do things out of uh, a so from a social good perspective. And um, that's great. And those can be the early adopters in a market. And uh, I'm certainly appreciative of those that do that, those things that they uniquely believe in some opportunity or uniquely believe in some cause to act ahead of government regulation. It tends to be um, mass government regulation that drives uh, uh, the, the stick. The carrot usually isn't big enough for people to pursue. And so it tends to be the stick that ends up playing out. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so we we only have about five minutes left. Um, there, <laughs> there's a question from Trey. Oh, uh, Trey, what's going on? Uh, Trey, feel free to answer in the chat. <laughs> I can be your intermediary. Um, he's again, uh, Trey is thanking you for your time. Of course, we're all very appreciative. Uh, and I was actually, thank you for the reminder, Trey, because I was going to bring that up at the, at the start. Um, your podcast, Logan. What the heck? Yes. Um, so everyone, please follow Logan's podcast. Um, so you started, I think, about two years ago? Yes. Yeah. And so what prompted that? And um, and what it, what is, what's your what's your drive? Um, yeah, it's what's a great question. Mission? And Trey, thank you for the, uh, the plug. Um, so it was interesting. It was the peak of COVID. Um, and to be honest, I... Our market was super competitive and I didn't know, um, I wanted to stand out in some way and I didn't know exactly how to go about doing it. I had a decent sized Twitter following at the time and was dedicating efforts to that. And uh, that felt very ephemeral uh, and it didn't seem like, uh, you tweets, you know, you say something and then it disappears and, uh, and you don't get to show a multi-dimensional element of your personality really. Um, and so it's kind of like, the form factor is locked in. The amount of things you can say is locked in, and so, um, so I, I I thought about what I could do differently. Ultimately, uh, I couldn't come up with anything better, uh, and so I I don't think this was the peak of podcasts, but like pretty close to it. Uh, and and so I decided I would pursue it, um, and it's been an interesting journey. Uh, I would say it's advantageous to me on a few fronts. One is I get to meet uh, interesting people, uh, which is great. Uh, and so uh, the the types of people I've met, I mean, I've met, uh, uh, I've met Mark Cuban, I've met Daniel Eck from uh, Spotify, I've met Sam Altman from OpenAI, I'm doing Neeraj Shah from Wayfair tomorrow, um, go down the list, a bunch of really cool, interesting uh, people that I wouldn't have otherwise I've been had a reason to meet. And so that's been interesting. Um, two, you learn a lot about like, I was sort of just riffing on a bunch of different company stories and journeys and all that stuff. And I've always sort of had a, I've always been kind of a nerd for business history, but um, there is a nice forcing function of when you're going to sit down with someone to learn mm -hmm. their story. There's a forcing function to um, uh, consume this information that the pressure isn't quite there when you're just doing it on your own time. And so it gives me a lot of uh, examples I can draw on in board meetings or lessons that I can extrapolate on because of XYZ person's experience that I learned in preparation for doing uh, this, a, a podcast out there. And so that's been advantageous as well. It's definitely increased my uh, visibility and name recognition, which I think helps with uh, our investors and I think helps with entrepreneurs. It's hard to say exactly how much. That's a little bit of a um, uh, finger in the wind uh, element of it. But I would say the net of it is beneficial. I'm reaching uh, a point of um, uh, there's a finite number of, of, of I got through all the easy enough people for me to re reach over the course of the last two years. And now I'm uh, going after the more difficult people. Uh, and I, I thought, I uh, I guess uh, this will be up there, but I'm trying to do uh, like things that are off the beaten path a little bit from mm -hmm. tech. And so uh, 
uh, some examples of things that I, I, I think are interesting that I've been talking about doing is Skims and, you know, the group that started that with Kim Kardashian, I, I think is interesting. Lululemon, uh, mm -hmm. the founder of Lululemon has a really interesting story. Um, and you can go down the line of just like other interesting businesses, giving people the opportunity to tell their stories. And so I'm continuing to noodle where they're interesting entrepreneurial um uh, anecdotes that I can help people mm -hmm. tell their, their version of events around. That's awesome. Well, we'll be sure to share the link, uh, on our social media platforms and, uh, and we always send a, a recap to, in our newsletter and, um, for the recording and so on and so forth. So, uh, anyone who registered, there is a recording that will be shared. Feel free to, uh, share the link to your network. Um, Logan, thank you so, so, so much. I uh, really deeply appreciate you being with us this morning and carving out the time. Uh, thanks for all your phenomenal, great, just really, uh, really great insights. It's been a Oh, awesome. Well, th thanks everyone for doing this. And uh, yeah, everyone that's on the entrepreneurial journey, I um, it sounds like a platitude, but uh, I can't do my job without people doing uh, yours. And so I have the utmost respect for anyone that's uh, pursuing some entrepreneurial endeavor. So, so thank you everyone that's, uh, that's doing that. I realize it's a, uh, it's a grind. I'm fortunate enough to see across a bunch of different portfolio companies and the ups and the downs and all that stuff. But without you, I can't do it. I do. And uh, I think that the only way we drive innovation forward, the only way we are able to change the world seemingly today tends to come from the private markets, tends to come from entrepreneurialism, uh, which is an important statement on uh, on government at times, but um, I, it wouldn't be without uh, the efforts of, of folks like yourselves that uh, uh, we we wouldn't be able to change the world in some way. So so thanks everyone for doing what you do. Thanks. Thanks again, Logan. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good day. Uh, awesome.